Okay, so today we'll do part one. Today we'll do part one of uh, the end of our foundation course or foundations uh, lesson, returning to his paths, right? So that's what we've been trying to um, break down. Um, we haven't uh, dived into all the historical context and all the details. Uh, we have uh, tried to build a solid ground, a solid foundation on um, what is this that we call our faith um, and how does it relate to probably Christianity or, or how it doesn't relate to Christianity or how can we differentiate what is knowing God and what is following God, right? Or what is knowing Jesus or knowing about Jesus or Yeshua, right? So the more we understand that is knowing God and understanding what he requires of us and what he des his desire is um, from us in the same way from Jesus or Yeshua, what he desires from us and who he is and what he represents, the more we understand that, the more that we respect that, then the more we will uh, will be able to grow, we'll be able to mature, uh, not only in in our faith, but in our lives, right? And, and, and how we manage um, ourselves in the world that we live in, um, in which, you know, we are conflicted because we grow up in a culture that not, not necessarily is uh, seeking to do God's will, um, but they do um, enjoy the benefits of God's creation. And so we have to understand that God intended creation and humanity to fulfill a, a, a specific purpose and design um, that is completely tied to him, the creator. Um, and so as individuals and as humans, we have decided to um, build uh, societies that are more like men and less like God. And so our mission and our purpose is to grow and understand that we have to be more like God. And the best way that we can do that is by following his commandments and by obeying his statutes and what he requires um, so that we can fall in line to what he intends us to be, not only for his kingdom, but for creation itself. Okay, so lesson number 10, the final lesson, part one, the foundation, the returning to his paths. Okay. Um, Ruth chapter 1 verse 16 to 17 says <clears throat> but Ruth said do not urge me to leave you or turn back from you, following you for where, where you go I will go and where you lodge I will lodge your people shall be my people and your God my God where you die I will die and there I will be buried Thus may the Lord do to me, and worse if anything, but death parts you and me. So after reviewing the lessons of the foundation, we are now ready to look at the prophetic future of God's people. The people of Israel are destined to return to scriptures of Israel and be reunited back to the land of Israel. Gentile believers are also destined to return in the same way since they have been rescued and grafted onto the people of Israel and their inheritance. In preparation for the glorious event of our final redemption, the restoration of the Hebrew Messiah, the Hebrew Gospel, and the Hebrew disciples, an understanding of the Torah are the most important requirements. So this is what we have been understanding that um, our mindset as believers today has to be 
uh, the closest to um, a humble servant, the closest to a gracious person that has been invited, that has been given uh, the blessing and the opportunity that was not deserving of it, not only because uh, of not being worthy, but not also because we didn't know. We had no idea that loving God and honoring God uh, entailed all of this that we have talked about because traditionally and culturally, it has been watered down to, you know, love and, and peace and be a good person. But the details have never been discussed, right? Because um, in our philosophy and in our structure and culture, the, the foundation is believed to be removed, right? It is done away with, right? And so that's why Yeshua says that if you build on the rock, then when the storms come and the waters come, the house won't fall. But if we build on sand, then it will be washed away. So removing the foundation, removing the rock, which is God and his word, is going to cause to leave um, cracks in your foundation, which um, can lead to your foundation crumbling. You can relate that to Cain and Abel, right? Cain, God tells him that, you know, sin is at the door, right? Why is sin at the door? Because Cain is inviting it. Cain is acknowledging that not only there's sin, but he require he knows that is at the door, and he was willingly open to opening the door for sin, right? And in that case, he kills Abel. And so, the best way to lay a great foundation, we learn it from Yeshua, right? Jesus, which is humbleness, and that humbleness um, comes from within right the ability to understand who you are what you want and then put what you want and who you are next to what god desires you and has designed you to be and if what you want and what you desire does not align with what god god wants from you and desires from you then you have two choices believe that you know better than god or do your best to align yourself, find a balance, and sometimes you will have to restructure everything. And so here Ruth uh, is a great testimony to it, right? Because she's a Moabite, uh, and from her lineage, right, a Moabite woman, Ruth, is that Yeshua comes from. So uh, the words of Ruth are beautiful, right? She says, uh, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Right? Ruth was being faithful to her mother-in-law, right? Which had become a widow, just like Ruth. They had lost everything, and so he, he her mother-in-law, saying, "You know, leave me, cause you're gonna die. You're not gonna. There's nothing you can 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 do. We have nothing left." We have nobody to protect us, to claim us, to redeem us. And Ruth, even though they had that situation, she said to her mother-in-law, I have, as a Moabite, remember, not an Israelite, she says, I will follow you and I'll be faithful to you. And not only I will be faithful to you, but I'll be faithful to your God. Because your God is my God, your people are my people. And so for us, we are more like Ruth we find out all these things later on right so we come from the outside in right and so the first steps into this faith is understanding that god's people will be our people and he will be our god and that where he decides we will die we will die and we will die also with his people and we have to understand that we are connected we're not better they're not better we're all trying to follow God's 
word and purpose. Okay, so the purpose of this lesson, we will examine the prophetic fate of the Hebrew people. Likewise, we will examine the prophetic destiny of the Gentiles. We will discuss the concept of being grafted to the people, and we will see the implications of being believers, both Jews and Gentiles. So before concluding our course, we must clear that we have laid a secure foundation. So in lesson one, we have to remember lesson one is the Torah. We learned that the Torah is the instructions for his people Israel and the foundation of the entire Bible, right? So the Torah, God's instruction. God's word right? is God's word is in the beginning, right? That's why John says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, right? God's word, the spoken word that he spoke in creation that gave, gave or brought forth light, that brought forth life, that brought forth order, structure, and, and, and uh, a perfect blueprint to creation that has been working. Like, I, like we've been talking, right? Nature, right? So from the beginning, God's word, God's instruction has been the deciding factor on life. So in lesson number one, the Torah, we understand that the Torah is the instructions for his people, Israel, and the foundation of the entire Bible. The instruction for his people, Israel, and the foundation for the entire Bible. Lesson one, we learned this. And we discussed this. For lesson two, we spoke about born again. Salvation is by grace only, but its result is the new creation, right? You're saved by grace. Good. Now, the result is that you are new. You're a new creation. Living in the justice of God, right? So just because you are saved by grace, it doesn't stop. Because now you have to live, right? You're saved. That means that if you're there is say of salvation, then you have life, a new life. And in this new life, how do you live? According to what God dictated was justice, righteousness. What God dictated was mercy and goodness. Okay? So lesson number two, born again. Salvation is by grace. Only, but its result is the new creation living in the justice of God. Now, in lesson number three, the covenant of promise, Jeremiah 31, verse 31 to 33 says, Behold, days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh, but this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them on their hearts and I will write it and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now, that's number three. The promise, the covenant of promise is that this new covenant, this renewed covenant, right, which is in the New Testament, this new covenant does not cancel the Torah because the Torah is part of the new covenant. But when the first Torah was given, they didn't accept it in their hearts. They obeyed it. Out of fear, out of survival, right? Because we see it in in Torah in the, the last Torah portions, and we will discuss it in this week's Torah portion also, right? Every time they decide to take matters into their own hands, they say "Shalach uh, lecha." They send the spies. They come back and say, "Yes, the land the land is good. It's fruit, good, but." They have these guys and these guys, Anach, Amalekites. And so, you know, they're, they, 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 they're bigger than us. We shall go back to Egypt, right? And so they constantly 
um, are acting in a in a in a sense of survival, all right, and disobeying God. And so it demonstrated that they're not necessarily following God out of love and out of acceptance of what they have received from heaven, but mostly based on results, right? So they obeyed the commandments. If they saw results right away, good. But the moment that they had to be responsible and they had to do their part, then they will rebel and question, et cetera, et cetera. But he says that now in this new covenant, it'll be in our hearts. It'll be within the people. And he will be our God and we will be his people. So lesson number three, the covenant of promise in the new covenant, it does not cancel the Torah because the Torah is part of the new covenant. You cannot remove it. Lesson four, we learn about Yeshua, Jesus Christ, Yeshua our Messiah. Yeshua was a loyal Jew. He was a Jewish man, a Jew from the tribe of Judah. He was without sin, meaning that he obeyed the law. Did he obey the whole law? No, not the whole law, because not the whole law applies to him. The law for the woman doesn't apply to him. The law of the Levites doesn't apply to him. But the law, the part of the law that applied to him, he kept it. And he made he kept it to the highest standard, which made him the Torah made flesh. Because he took God's word and put it in his heart and he manifested the best version of a human obeying God's word. So our master, our teacher, our rabbi, Yeshua was a loyal Jew, right? Without sin, meaning he didn't transgress the Torah because he kept it and he became the living Torah. The Torah made flesh based on how he lived and how he acted and how he treated others in obedience. Lesson five, we talked about discipleship. Discipleship is the art of imitation. A disciple imitates their teacher. And the only way, like I told you guys, the only way that you will imitate your teacher is if your teacher is imitating God. And how does your teacher imitate God? Seeking God's will, seeking God's purpose, seeking God's wisdom. Not his own, but God's. And if your teacher, even though he's not perfect, right? even though he's not Yeshua himself, but if that teacher is doing his best and you see that he is seeking God's purpose and desires God's will, then you imitate. But you should always understand that above your teacher is Yeshua. And above Yeshua is the Father. So once you master the art of imitating your teacher, you have to master the art of imitating Yeshua. And if you are able to master the art of imitating Yeshua, then understand that we have to master the art of imitating our creator. And the way that we do that is obeying his word. Because in his word is the way that we can act as if we were his image. So discipleship is the art of imitation. So if you're a disciple of God, then you as a disciple, your teacher shall all align with Yeshua and his father. Lesson number six, Paul versus Saul. The apostle Paul remained faithful to the Torah until the end of his days. Right? So we had to learn to understand Paul based on his culture, based on his mindset, based on his lifestyle that he lived. Now what we imply now, what we have designed and created around Paul. No, we have to listen to what Paul says and listen to why Paul is saying it and understand the background that Paul has to say the things that he's saying, to understand where he's coming from. Because Paul is saying specific things 
based on a true Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. So the Apostle Paul remained faithful to the Torah until the end of his days. So the way that we listen to Paul is according to Torah. Lesson number seven. We also talked about Paul's letters, right? Because if Paul remained faithful to the Torah until the, day, the end of his days, that means that whatever he wrote is faithful to Torah, right? So Paul's letters do not teach against the Torah. They teach about the relationship of the Gentiles with the land, the people, and the scriptures of the Messiah of Israel. Understanding how Israel and the Gentiles are called to embrace not only one another, but also have the ability to embrace God's kingdom. Because through Yeshua, the kingdom is open for Israel and Gentiles. Okay, so Paul's letters do not teach against the Torah. They teach about the relationship of the Gentiles with the land, the people, and the scriptures of the Messiah of Israel. Now, lesson number eight it talks about the divine appoint, appointed times. It talked about the Shabbat, the biblical feast, and the divine appointed times that were not canceled. They teach us about the Messiah and the sanctification, which is very important because the Messiah teaches us how us, like Ruth, that have said, your people are my people, your God is our God, the us that are learning, that are growing, that are trying to reshape and understand God and his message and his purpose. Through the feast, year by year, cycle by cycle, we learn more about the salvation through Yeshua and the call of sanctifying ourselves, consecrating ourselves, separating ourselves, making ourselves better, holier, right? For God. And the way that we're able to do all these things is through obedience to his word. Lesson number nine. We learn about the commandments, which is how can we properly apply the commandments, right? So the proper application of the commandments arises because of the love for God, not for the feeling of bound, right? The Torah gives us 613 opportunities to serve him. And so understanding that um, we are free to obey and not slaves to obedience, it's going to be very important because being free to obey means that God is giving you the option, the opportunity to understand that you cannot do it by yourself. And if you follow the instructions, if you follow the design, then you'll be good. You will fall into not only your purpose, but you will find that your true meaning and your true desires are with God. Okay, so the destiny of the Jews. Right? Same prophecies that predicted that the suffering and dispersion of the people of Israel also predicted the Hebrew people have a wonderful destiny before them. The entire messianic restoration is called the final redemption. An ancient prophecy, which is in Deuteronomy 30, is referred to as a portion of repentance. Because in this verse, the pattern for the repentance and restoration of Israel, as it has. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 through 5 says, So it shall be when all of these things have come upon you, the blessings and the curses. Right. So this is obviously when he's finalizing the presentation the re-establishing um, and reiterating of the Torah to the new generation in the desert before they enter the, the, the land across the Jordan. Um, and they, they speak about the blessings and the curses. Uh, here is what it says. 
And you call them to mind in all nations where the Lord your God has banished them. Right? So it says, so it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing, the curse, which I have said before you, and you call them to mind in all the nations where you, the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to all the, the all that I commanded you today, you and your sons, then the Lord, your God, will restore you from cap captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord, your God, has scattered you. If you're outcast or at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord, your God, will gather you and from there he will bring you back. Your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed. And you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Okay, so this is the destiny, and the destiny is tied to the shuva, repentance, right? With the root word shuva to return, to come back. And so you you will see this happen a lot in life when you make mistakes, when you get too stubborn, right? And you stumble when you come back to your parents, your friends, your partners, whenever that happens, right? You understand that that action of admitting that you were wrong, that you made a mistake has to be true because the same way that you would desire for people to be honest and, and be um, if they are repentant of hurting you or disobeying you or being disloyal to you, but you would want it to be genuine, not something that they would do to get on your good side, but something they would do that they genuinely feel that they made a mistake, that they failed, that they were wrong. And the action of teshuva is that, right? But teshuva to God, understanding that us as creation don't understand, right? And 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 even though we are creative and we are uh, um, smart and have the ability to um, build societies, um, we're not God, and we need God. We need Him to be with us and amongst us, because He's the true designer. We are just designed. We are people that were created for a function and we believe that we can control things. But we barely can control life. Like I always tell you guys. So the shuva is repentance. The prophecy of the return is tied to the repentance from the, tr from the heart that truly is seeking God. Okay? And the root word shuv. Right? So Deuteronomy 30, the return of the Lord and a return to Torah and the land. And that's what he promises, that the people will come back to Torah and land. Okay? So, the first return is a return to the Lord. Right? Romans 11, verse 26 says, And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. Right? And Paul quotes, Isaiah 59, verse 20, which he's quoting the prophets, which is the Torah, right? And so here he says that the deliverer, the chosen one, the Mashiach, will come from Zion. And he will, his first act is to establish God's instruction and remove ungodliness, okay? The Deuteronomy 30, 30, verse 1, uh, verse 1. And two says, so it shall be when all these things have come upon you, the blessing and the curses, which I have said before you, and you call them to mind in all nations where your, the Lord your God has banished you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul according to that. I command you today, you and your sons. Both words are translated from the Hebrew word shuv. Right, so and you return, right? Or call to mind, remember, repent, 
in all the nations where the lawyer got right. So that's what we're doing here. We are saying we repent from our ignorance and our inability to know or understand based on whatever uh, uh, societal situation you are in, whether it be uh, either you were Christian and you will learn something different, or you were Catholic and you learned something different, or if you didn't know anything and you learned something different, right? But now that you know, you're called to repent or to shuv, which is to return, to come back, to turn to God and start walking to his direction in his uh, instructions, okay? Now, the Torah, returning to Torah, the second return is to Torah. So we come to the land, to the Lord, and now to Torah. Deuteronomy verse 8 says, and you shall again obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. You shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commands which I command you today. All, right. all this is prophetically um, established here. Now, the third return, the third return is to the land. Deuteronomy verse 3, chapter 30. Oh, your God will restore. Shuv, you from Cap captivity. I right. turn you back. And have compassion on you, and will gather you again, Shuv, from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. So repentance, restoration, and return. All right, so the first action is yours. The restoration is part of you repenting, accepting Yeshua, and walking in truth, which is the Torah. And in that process, you're returning. So you repent, the individual, Alex, I repent, right, in the example. And how do I restore this? Okay, I accept Yeshua as my Lord and Savior, understanding that by grace I have been given this opportunity through Yeshua. And how do I return? By walking in God's commandments and statutes. Okay? Is that me making it up? No, we're going to read it once more. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1 and 3 says, it shall come to pass when all these things shall come upon thee, the blessings and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt repent in the midst of all the nations. That's where we are. Whither the Lord thy God hath cast thee, and shall turn unto the Lord thy God, and obey your voice according to all that I command you this day, you and your children with all your heart. And with all your soul, then the Lord will restore your captivity and have mercy on you. And shuv, return, and will return all the nations whither the Lord thy God has scattered thee. Okay, so the point made is repent from your sins, repent from your ignorance, repent from your ununderstanding. Look to me and the wisdom that I have given you through my word. Walk in it and you will find your way back to me through the people, the land. Because like Ruth said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And guess what? Through Ruth, a woman from the nations, Moabite, came the deliverer. You can never forget that. Now, the final redemption, according to the scriptures of Israel, there will be a final meeting at the end of time in the land of Israel. In Judaism, this meeting is called the final redemption. Okay? In the final redemption, the Messiah will, right, Israel return to uh, the Lord. It will make Israel return to Torah, and it will make Israel return to the land, right? So the Messiah is going to make Israel do all these things. The Messiah in Judaism will make the people of Israel return to the Lord, the Torah, the land, the Lord, Torah, and land, to God, Torah, and land, right? Zionism and Messianic Zionism, right? Now, Zionism was a secular international political movement 
which was dedicated to the call to return to their land, to the people, to the Hebrew people, right? Uh, a year in which the restoration of Israel began, which was in 1948, right? And this uh, quoting here is the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 5. The Lord your God will bring you unto the land which your fathers possess, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers, right? And that's you can definitely see that now today in Israel. All right, so they're back. All right, so Deuteronomy is is amazing how Deuteronomy 30, verse 5 is being fulfilled. Right? But to us it seems like, oh yeah, you know, it's Israel. But God's word uh, itself is consistently being manifest, right? and we can ignore it, but it's there. Okay. Now it says, "Is this the final redemption?" Right. So now that we see in Israel, there's the the the, the people of uh, the Judaism, right? Jewish people are in Israel. They have possessed the land, and they have been they become fruitful. They have multiplied there, also, and so. What we have in Israel is that the final redemption. The state of Israel today is not the final redemption. Zionism and the state of Israel are only the beginning of the return of the promised land. Certainly, our prayer is to bless the land and the state of Israel because it is the beginning of our final redemption. Right? And so you always, 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 if you learn anything from last week's Torah portion, Shalach Lecha, is that you don't speak negatively about the land because that's where God's name, that's where God put his name. So you never talk about or negatively about the land of Israel because that's where God said, my name is there. And that's where I've chosen for my name, for my dwelling place. And even though the temple's not there and even though there is um, a, a, a mosque there, understand, that that place is where God's kingdom will be erected again. Temple will be erected. The heavens will open and Messiah will come to Jerusalem. So we have to pray consistently that even though what we see now is not the final redemption, it is the beginning of the final redemption. Okay? So, the fate of the Gentiles. The final redemption for the Gentiles that now are not Gentiles no more, right? Because Gentile means without law. So, but for those that are Gentiles that are, are learning to follow Torah, it says the final redemption, God will make all promises of his covenants with Israel fulfilled. The Messiah will come and fight for Israel. He will return them to their land and will, and will become king over Israel. He will reign over the entire Davidic kingdom, but where are the Gentiles in this kingdom? Right? That's a good question. Where are the Gentiles? What is their part in this? Right? In Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days, ten men from all nations will grasp the garments, the seats of a Jew, saying, Let's go with you. For we have heard that God is with you. The ten men in the Torah is the minimum number of people to form a congregation. In those days, ten men from all nations will grasp the garment of a Jew. Revelation 5 verse 9 says, They sang a new song saying, Worthy are you, to take the book and to break the, its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nations. Okay? Minyan in the Hebrew is a group of 10 uh, qualifies as a congregation. So Genesis 18, verse 32 says that he said, Oh my God, the Lord, not be angry, and I shall speak only this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account 
of 10, right? This is talking about um, Abraham, where he's um, going back and forth with, with God and trying to protect Zodom from Bora. Okay, so here, the prophetic message of the Gentiles is uh, that these Gentiles, these nations, uh, they will cling to the seats of a Jew, right? Um, and that they will basically manifest that which Ruth said, which was, again, people, my people, and your God is our God, right? And they will see this man, whoever this man is, uh, obviously we understand that it's Yeshua. Uh, once they see this man, they will grab onto the seats, right? Which the seats, uh, symbolically, in the command, they represent the commandments, right? So the cities are there for you to remember that you are in covenant with God, that you are a prince, right? In a in a in a uh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, right? So the cities remind remind you that you follow God's commandments, you follow God's instruction, you follow God's word. You are representative of His kingdom, and so when you cling to the cities of this Jew, what you're clinging is to that which God called a kingdom of priests and a holy nation based on his commandments. Okay? So, uh, here in Exodus 18, verse 21 says, Furthermore, you shall select out of all the people able men who fear God, men of truth, those who hate dishonest gain, and you shall place these over them as leaders of thousands, of hundreds, and of fifties, and of tens, right? So here's making a big emphasis on the number 10 and how it represents the congregation, okay? Now, numbers, the commandment of the tzitzis. So you guys know and remember, Numbers 15, verse uh, 38, 39, speak to us as of Israel and tell them that they shall make for themselves tassels on the borders of their garments throughout their generations. And they shall put on the tassels of each corner a quarter blue. It shall be tassel for you to look at and remember all the commandments of the Lord, so as to do them and not follow after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you played the harlot. All right, so remember the imagery of the ten nations or the ten Gentiles or the ten uh, uh, people grabbing onto the cities of the Jews encompasses everything that we have been talking about, right? The commandments, it embodies remembering that to follow your own eyes, which is that, that which that's what Yeshua teaches, right? In your own heart, but to remember that you are clinging to God's command, to clinging to his desire, his wisdom, okay? Malachi chapter four, verse two says, but for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in, in its wings. The tzitzis, right? That's what it, that's when the Hebrew uh, it represents the tzitzis. And you will go forth and skip about like calf from stall. Tzitzi, the fringes, tied to the four corners of the mantle with which they are covered. The commandment was given to all children of Israel, men and women, especially when wearing a robe like the tali. So these tzitzis in the prophecy um, represent that the sun of healing will bring healing through its wings. Right? And this is metaphorically the, talking about uh, Yeshua. Right? Yeshua himself uh, in the case of the woman with the fluid of blood, what does she do? She clings to the seeds of Yeshua, and in that moment, she's healed. And hence, fulfilling Malachi 4, verse 2, which talks about the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, right? So the talit, or the seeds, right, the talikatan, that where we wear the seeds under, uh, under our shirts, are uh, descriptive of wings, right? Metaphorically, when you wear the talit, it is like wings. Um, and so if you ask Pablo, he would show you. And so 
uh, the tzitzis are a big representation of um, God's kingdom, God's word, and not to follow your own heart and your own eyes. Okay, so the kanaf, which is the corner of your of your of your tzitzis, I mean of your garments, whether it be the tali or the tali katan, um, you will see that. The talit and the talikatam have these corners where the seat seat is at, and that's where um, the reference of the wings is, right? The kanaf. But it says the kanaf, which is the corner or wings, uh, are the corners of the mantle that is regularly used among the Hebrews. It is the talit or mantle that is used to cover itself while praying. Uh, its corners are tied to the seat seats. Zechariah. Chapter 8, verse 23 says, In those days, ten men from all nations will grasp the garments of the Jew, right? The sitiot, in scripture, represent the commandments. The Jew mentioned in the verse of Zechariah, chapter 8, verse 23, is the Messiah of Israel. The ten men are the Gentiles who have clung to the Messiah in his commandments, right? When it talks about a Jew, it's talking about Yeshua, hey? Eh? Isaiah 2 verse 3 says, And many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion. And that is our desire, our desire that Israel becomes prosperous, that Israel is able to build that temple. And whenever the Antichrist and all those things that prophetically are called to happen, we have to be consistently looking to Jerusalem and understanding that there Yeshua will be reigning and we will go up there rejoicing because eternal life with our God and our Creator is near. Okay, so we're going to close out with Isaiah 56 says, Who is the Gentile who takes the covenant? And the Shabbat in Isaiah 56. So I'm going to read it from there. Let me see if I can uh, switch it to the Bible. Let's go to Isaiah 56. Says, can you guys see my screen? You good? Yes. Okay. There you go. All right. Isaiah 56 says the following. Thus says the Lord, preserve justice and do righteousness for my salvation, right? My salvation, and the hero is Yeshua, right? My salvation is about to come, right? Very interesting. Let me see if I can put it here and you can see. Uh, it says here, Yeshua, Yeshua, right? It says, my salvation, I just shoot up. It's about to come. My righteousness to be revealed. How blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who takes hold of it, who keeps from profaning the Shabbats and keeps his hand from doing any evil. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Now let the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Shabbat and choose what pleases me and hold fast my commandment. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of the sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. And also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servant. Everyone who keeps from profaning the Shabbats and holds fast to my covenant even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house. 
of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices, I will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the people. The Lord God who gathers the dispersed of Israel declares, yet others I will gather to them, to those already gathered. All you beasts of the field, all you beasts of the forest, come to eat. His watchmen are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are mute, dogs unable to bark, dreamers lying down who love to slumber. And the dogs are greedy and they are not satisfied. And they are shepherds who have no understanding. They all turn to their own way, each to his unjust gain. To the last one, come, they say, let us get wine and let us drink heavily of strong drink. And tomorrow will be like today, only more. So, so, very interesting how here it talks about the eunuch and the foreigner embracing God's Shabbats, what pleases God, and hold fast to God's covenant, right? And how those people that necessarily are eunuchs that don't have descendancy in God's kingdom, that are not of the people, that are not sons and daughters from lineage, from the seed of Abraham, but that hold fast to him, the God, the creator. Those people, they get a better name. They get a bigger, a bigger name. Not because they're better than, but because they held fast to God's Shabbats, because they held fast to God's commandments, because they desired and were willing to obey God's structure and understand that he, God, is our foundation and his foundation is found in his words and his commands and what he wants from us. So I always tell you guys, don't worry about if you are from a tribe or not. Don't worry about if you're a Levite, Judah, if you're Ephraim, if you are Nephtali, if you are don't worry about being from a specific tribe. Because at the end of the day, we are all part of the kingdom. Whether you have lineage or whether you're grafted in. But God is not looking for lineage or grafted. He's looking for those that are willing to do his will. Because only the ones that are willing to do his wills are the ones that are rightful heirs to the promises. Whether if you have lineage or whether you are grafted in, you have to understand that your heart has to keep the Shabbat, choose what pleases him, and hold fast to his covenant. Because he himself says, I will give you in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than of sons and daughters. And I will give them an everlasting name which will never be cut off. So, for part one of lesson number 10. Remember, our foundation is our creator. Our foundation is God's word. And the more we do our best to imitate our Messiah and imitate our God as disciples, as teachers, as human beings, then we will build a better world and we will start the restoration of God's kingdom and when in Jerusalem there's war we pray for them and when in Jerusalem there's success we pray for them 
and we are joyful of their success. Because remember, in Jerusalem, in that land, God put his name. And in that land, all of us will see the manifestation of God's prophetic word. And maybe, just maybe, we're part of those 10, 10 nations, 10 men that hold fast to our Messiah, Yeshua. So, so we got for this part. You guys have any questions? Any concerns? Not for nope. me. Okay. Caddies? Genie? Everybody good? Yes. Okay. All right. I'll take you for that. So, shallow, shallow. <laughs>